Hi friends, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am Santosh Kana and today's episode is in the series of interviews that I have on my channel, Converse with Kana. And this episode is really, really special because the guest for this episode on my channel is Dr. Rajesh Kana, who is my own elder brother. And that's not the only reason to have this interview. He is the professor of psychology and neurosciences at University of Alabama, United States of America. This episode, I'm going to ask him about his two decades of research in the field of autism and the book that he has just published titled the neuroscience of autism and I am very sure this discussion would be giving the contemporary reliable scientific insights into all those who are looking for some guidance related to mental health and autism. So with these words let me proudly and happily welcome my elder brother Dr. Rajesh Kana to my channel Santosh Kana. So this is Kana in conversation with Kana. Rajesh Khanna and Santosh Khanna. Yeah, welcome, Doctor. Thank you. So, uh, the first thing I would like to ask is like, uh, there is a lot of discussion about mental health and mm -hmm. autism in particular these yeah. days, you yeah. know, uh, whether it is in educational institutions or in many public platforms. So, uh, instead of asking you uh, what is autism, I feel it is uh, more appropriate to ask uh, what are the common uh, misconceptions about autism uh, from your work in this field for the past two decades. Yeah, we'll start with that. So one of the major misconceptions about autism is um, that many people believe that um, individuals with autism can remember numbers, um, numbers in the sense if you say a date like 1943, October 6, they would narrate all the significant things happened on that day actually. Okay. But this is only applicable to a smaller population of autism actually, okay. maybe about 5 to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. You would call it autistic savants. They have these amazing abilities. So this is not generalized to all people with autism. So that's a misconception if anybody is thinking that, you know, all autistic individuals are amazingly talented and then can, you know, remember things like this. So it's a spectrum with a variety of abilities and uh, difficulties. So you have severely autistic individual as well as a really high functioning autistic individual. So I would say that's probably one of the major misconceptions. So it's quite heterogeneous and uh, that's why it's called a spectrum. It is, well, right? exactly, exactly. That's why it's called. Uh, so uh, like I remember uh, reading a quote on autism uh, which very well uh, connects to what you have been telling mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, if you meet one individual with autism you just meet only one individual with autism that is right yeah so th th there is a quote which people say usually that you know the only similarity between two people with autism is that they are different <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a spectrum and uh, People can have different abilities in there. Um, a, the manifestation of characteristics of autism in one child or one adult can be entirely different from that in a different child or different adult. You know, so that's what makes it very intriguing and, and complex disorder. So that brings me to my next question: uh, it is uh, how significant it is to have a neuroscience approach uh, to autism and psychology psychology in general and autism in particular because we have always heard about theories you mm -hmm. know and that will also be telling us about what exactly are you doing in your workspace yeah yeah i think you know what neuroscience does is you know, it brings more precision and tangibility to um, psychological questions like for example you know decades ago psychological questions were answered at the psychological level like okay. tracking it back to psychoanalysis and you know childhood experiences and so on and so forth and what neuroscience brings is basically some sort of like you know um, concreteness to what is behind you know 
the mechanisms behind a, a certain phenomenon, uh, which is a cognitive phenomenon or um, any other functions, you know. So, it gives a more precision in terms of measurement. You can look at the brain structure or brain function and tell that, you know, this could be the reason behind a particular psychological function. So, that's exactly what neuroscience does, you know, it gives more um, accessible sort of experiences which are more accurate and then more um, concrete yeah. and scientific. Yeah. So, uh, the thing is like, um, so when we talk about this, um, in your um, university where mm -hmm. you're working in this field, mm -hmm. what are the kinds of, uh, you know, experiments or, you know, tasks that you undertake when you deal with uh, those who are detected with, um, you know, autism? Yeah. Yeah, so we engage, you know, um, in different types of um, cognitive and social experiments with uh, children and adults with autism. Um, and, and our experiments are defined by the questions and the research questions which we are asking. Like for example, you know, one of the difficulties, you know, autistic individuals have in reading other people's minds. Like for example, Could you give we, an, uh, yeah. Yeah, we are engaged in a conversation and then suddenly I am looking at my watch. Okay. And you have no access to what's going on in my mind actually. But I can assume. But you can assume like what must be going on in my mind, right? You know, so you make theories about what's going on in my mind. It's called theory of mind. Okay. Um, so that idea of mind reading is kind of the glue which builds social interaction. Oh, okay. And if you have difficulty in mind reading, you do have difficulty in reading what other people's are, people are thinking about and that can lead to a lot of um, stumbling blocks in social interaction. Mm. So how do you design an experiment to capture the essence of mind reading, right? So you can have two people interacting and then you figure out what kind of mental state each of those persons are. That could be an experiment. Yeah. Uh, so like that, I think, you know, what you choose a research question and then build an experiment that can test that precise question by controlling all those external variables which may be affecting and testing that exact variable which you are interested in. Okay. So what kind of uh, medical technology are you using for this? So in, in my research lab what we are using is magnetic resonance imaging. So simply the, the is it neuroimaging? Neuroimaging, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's also called brain mapping. That's exactly what we do. Um, so we use MRI um, technique and within MRI there are different kinds of techniques built in. Like for example, um, you can take stat pictures you know just like photographs of a person lying in the MRI scanner and then you can look at those pictures and figure out you know uh, the structure of uh, structural details you know of that person's brain it could be um, volume it could be thickness and so on and so forth you can also look at you know how your brain is responding to a certain task on you know in a live sort of way uh, like for example you're reading a set of sentences how your brain is responding to that. So we can track the activity in different parts of the brain and that is called functional MRI or fMRI because it's tracking the, uh, the functions. So like that, you know, by using the same machine, you are kind of controlling different protocols to adjust and measure structure, function, connectivity, chemical concentration, all those kinds of things, you know. And all these different inferences coming from method, these different methods can be used for um, building a theory, you know, related to an actual cognitive function or a, a difference in cognitive function in a specific population. So uh, one of the things that I have been, since I'm uh, teaching mm -hmm. uh, like most parents and teachers and educational institutions um, they may be having lots of doubts regarding you know learning disabilities yeah, and one of the things is like as teachers um, uh, not all of us would have the expertise to deal with, um, you know, learning disabilities and uh, such issues, you know. So, in your opinion, what could be some of the, uh, you know, basic things that educational institutions mm -hmm. and teachers and, and parents uh, could do uh, in dealing with the basic aspects of uh, uh, issues related to learning disabilities and also autism in particular? How can they equip themselves? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I think you know one of the basic things with related to any disability for that matter and, and with autism too is to bring up the awareness about the disorder. Like the more you know about the disorder, I mean the more chances are that you know you will take your child to a clinic to get a diagnosis and then you know the chances of intervention are also much more after that. 
So that that's one of the things to do. And but then the uh, there, before we come to the next point sure. there, but when uh, talking about this, there is a lot of social conditioning here that yeah. uh, stigmatizes this, you know, going to counselors and all that. So yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, um, you know, get fixed overnight. Mm. I mean, those sto social stigmas and social situations are, it's what it is, you know, you cannot do much about it. So one of the things that a parent should do is to not to worry much about it, you know, and then uh, don't get like disappointed by a diagnosis, actually. The first thing to do is to understand Panic. that, you know, you cannot do much about it, you know. If there is a diagnosis, there is a diagnosis. There is nothing else you can do about it, you know. Um, so the first thing to think about is um, what needs to be done for the betterment of that child, you know, um, in, in future. Um, so that's what you need to find out, find out more about, you know, and um, find out the therapist for, for that child, find out if there is any difficulties that needs to be addressed, you know. So all those are the, the questions right in front of you and everything takes a back step at that point, you know. And educational institutions, what can they do? You, uh, like, sh should we have a mental health first aid, uh, you know, uh, someone to approach to? And you know. Yeah, I, I think, you know, resources, improving resources and increasing resource persons at different institutions would be one of the key things, you know. And that resources can be clinical psychologists, it could be special education teachers, it could be counselors, you know. Right. Um, it could be anybody like that, you know, which can provide a support system for a child or an adult. Um, with a diagnosis of any of these disorder so that the parents don't have to run from pillar to post you know looking for what do I need to do for my yeah. my child and again this doesn't come overnight either um, there has to be a concerted effort in terms of training new people um, building new um, batch or group of um, students and train them into uh, becoming personnel you know who are um, who has the expertise in 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 yeah. those areas you know even this uh, you know alumni who are, uh, you know who are in the field of uh, uh, similar you know research they yeah. can also be invited exactly exactly like i think one of the things they could do is to get people you know yeah. uh, to talk about you yes. know um, you know, autism or any other disability. Um, I mean, these days you don't need to bring somebody from abroad or other places. You know, it's yeah, very easy. You can get onto social media platforms, you know, and platforms then virtual and platforms and uh, have uh, talks and uh, build the knowledge base in, in our um, people around, and that can have significant impact. So, uh, from my uh, childhood, the interactions that I had with my brother. It uh, used to be, or it has been, about uh, mental health, mm -hmm. psychology, mm -hmm. movies, art, and literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th that is definitely enriched me as a person. And uh, where exactly uh, in your school education or college education you thought about uh, taking up psychology, or where exactly you started uh, this, I should do research on autism. You know, what was that triggering factor? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, after my uh, bachelor's in, in chemistry, um, one of the or couple of things which I did, you know, was, you know, one to do a bachelor's in education and then a master's in education. All these times, you know, you get to learn more about psychology through different courses, you know. So that that's the first um, trigger which, which kind of helped me think more about psychological questions and a kind of like a a little bit of pressure to learn a learn a pressure or interest to learn more about psychological um, theories and principles uh, so that's that's where it started and then when i joined for my phd uh, there was this book uh, i read at that time it's called an anthropologist on mars it's written by uh, one of the famous uh, neuro neurologists his name is uh, oliver sachs Oliver Sacks writes beautiful books about you know different case studies you know these are all oh. neurological cases okay. and um, there is a chapter in this book you know which is about you know um, a person and um, that is called anthropologist on Mars the person's name is Temple Grandin Temple Grandin has a PhD she's a faculty in one of the universities in the US she also has autism spectrum disorder diagnosis okay. Okay. and um, here is a person who is really high functioning goes about her life just like any other individual and um, the chapter is really fascinating about you know her strengths and her difficulties and her sensory difficulties and so on and so forth you know so that was the second trigger which made 
me interested in doing something about autism and at that time this was a couple of decades ago when you look at psychological textbooks actually you would see only a paragraph or maybe a page about autism spectrum disorder written at that time so we thought this would be a great area to do some research and that's exactly what what happened you know we started doing work in that area. Uh, it's quite um, interesting that you know all our viewers would be uh, definitely benefited by the kind of uh, discussion that we are having especially the book that you have mentioned. <laughs> so on that note, uh, could you please recommend a few more uh, books and uh, movies and uh, you know these days we have many shows as well you know mm -hmm. that uh, are about mental health and autism. Yeah. Yeah, with regard to autism, I would recommend one movie, which is, um, it's called The Rain, Rain Man. Yeah. Dustin Hoffman. And Dustin yeah. Hoffman um, is acting as a high-functioning autistic person in that movie. Um, again, um, we have to be careful that, you know, that sh movie shows an autistic savant in, in it. And um, many of the characteristics, you know, displayed there are true for any autistic person. But that's not the entire picture of autism. Oh, okay. But you can still get a clear idea about oh. what characteristics of autism are. So that's a good movie. And there are movies about Temple Grandin as well, you know, and there are shows on Netflix these days, you know, talking about autism um, as well. With regard to books, I think, you know, um, apart from academic reading, I think one of the things to do would be to pick up some of the biographies and autobiographies of um, autistic individuals writing about themselves, you know. Uh, those books can be very handy. And then one book I would totally recommend, is, you know, which people can read very easily, is um, it's called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It's written by somebody who does not have autism, but at the same time um, who wrote from the perspective of a, of a person with autism. And um, that, that's a novel and it's a very easy read, provides all the um, characteristics and experience of a person with autism going through in the real world. Yeah, that's a pretty detailed uh, list. And coming to this book that you have just published, this is, as I told you in the intro, The Neuroscience of Autism, edited by uh, Dr. Adesh Khanna. And it is published by uh, Elsevier, right? Yeah, Elsevier uh, uh, Publications. Uh, it's, a, they're based at it's, ba it's based in Netherlands um, okay. and, um, and it's very widely popular in the US as well. You know, yeah. So I was uh, going through the book and I should tell you this, uh, it is a really interesting read in the sense that it, it's not a dry, uh, you know, academic kind of writing that I saw here, yeah. you know, it, it really captured me. I kept reading, you know, there are 12 chapters uh, in the book and um, written by uh, renowned researchers across the globe mm -hmm. uh, who are doing research into uh, autism, right? That's right yeah. uh, could you say something about the process of writing this book and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, the work involved in it? Yeah. So yeah, so initially the, the process of writing this book was basically, you know, I was teaching a course on autism and um, I wanted to cover a certain content in that course and there wasn't any one book available for covering all those things actually. So I thought maybe I should write the book. So initially the plan was for me to write the entire book. Then as I went and went on with it and I realized that maybe it's it will be more useful for the field to have multiple researchers perspective about different things rather than one person writing about it you know and then um, that led to bringing in people from across the globe you know who are doing one fantastic research on different aspects of autism and um, now we have all these chapters you know covering different aspects of autism starting from behavior to cognition to brain and then back to behavior you know so that's the pattern of the book Okay. Where is the book available for our... So I think uh, the book is available on uh, major platforms online, like uh, Amazon.com, Amazon. it's there, and then some other, you know, book stalls like Barnes & Noble and, and, and things like that. So before winding up, I would uh, like to thank uh, my brother, Dr. Rajesh Khanna, for sparing uh, time for us to provide his, you know, experience in the field of autism, his research, his work for the last two decades and really a big thanks to you uh, for this and could you give some uh, concluding words to our viewers? Yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much for inviting me to do this thing, you know, not many people will have an academic discussion or interview like this, you know, based on an academic book. Okay. So uh, that that's great and you know, it's a great sign. 
and uh, I really enjoyed and good luck with uh, your your channel and thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you.